Good morning, Jeremy. Hi, Steve. So we are here talking about Vandendorp and annotation and um, following up from our conversation last week. So here we'll demo and chat and hopefully set our students and participants and um, annotators free to do their work. So you ready? Here we go. So what I've built um, in the true spirit of TiddlyWiki is an annotator. <laughs> and, um, and I just wanna walk through and we'll talk a little bit about some of the TiddlyWikiFication challenges. Um, so basically, I created a set of annotag tools that runs off of a macro, um, which you can of course find the code. And it's basically just at the top. I think the rest of the stuff I don't use. Um, and what this does is allows us to go to an essay. In this case, we'll start with essay seven since that's the one I've done. Um, take a quick look at how it's um, structured. So every paragraph is excised using a macro called annotag. And that that macro basically transcludes the tiddler and then puts this box in. And I will ask the TiddlyWiki group how I can get this little doodad there at the end of the paragraph so I don't have to have them where they are so that they're closely associated with the paragraph. I haven't figured that out yet. What this does is creates a new tiddler with the username and then the word on and then the name of the paragraph tiddler from whence it came. It tags the tiddler with the paragraph tiddler from whence it came plus the identifier of a nano tag tiddler plus my name and also puts the same things in fields in case we use them later. And someday Jeremy will talk about fields and tags and that interplay. Um, but what I've done is gone ahead and tagged up nine annotations on 07. And eventually, like in another 20 minutes, they'll be organized by their tags. But right now they're sort of sequential. Um, and so that's what I've done. That's beautiful. The yeah. one usability, there's two usability issues. One is that, as I, I, like I said, I want this up here and I'll figure that out. And the other is that it's kind of cool. You, so you will just demo what you do and you, you might click here. Oh, in fact, this takes you to an existing um, annotation, which is good because I was overriding my annotations for a while. Um, so, it takes, so if you have an existing annotation in paragraph, it takes you there. What I don't know is, okay, that's wonderful. I close it. And I'd like to get back to my, to where I was. What happens is you have to come back and kind of find your way into this string of paragraphs. I don't know how to quite work that out yet, but that's the other challenge. Um, there is a, uh, the work I did on something called text slicer. Text. Shows so one you, you keep telling me text slicer. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, I'll learn text slicer. Um, that basically adds a, um, wow, good old Google. Okay, so now um, uh, click on the, in the open menu, click on sample text. And then click on the um, scissors icon. There now, in the left hand side, we've got that, that was an HTML document packed mm -hmm. in a tiddler. And now what we've got on the left hand side is the re is the the document split up into paragraphs and then reconstituted and so the cool thing is now on the open menu on the right you can do a close all and your tiddler's closed but you've still got the text on the left so now you can scroll your text if you click on one of those paragraphs on the left then it opens in the main column so i think for you if it, if you clicked on it and it did the same deal of opening the annotation tiddler ah. Quite nice. Okay, so I will add that struck stuff in. That's very cool. Good, thanks. And that will probably solve many of my issues. I think it'll solve both the ones you mentioned. Yeah. 
Yeah, okay. So let's, um, there, we'll dispense with our coding conversation and return to the substantive conversation. Um, and so I've played with number seven, and that's the, that's the, um, uh, oh, I don't have a link to seven. See, I, I, it's, I still have to sort of create this and make this a little bit easier. This is seven, linearity and tabularity, which I think is a really key essay in the, in the 12 that I've read so far. Um, and so I thought we kind of step through my annotations and I'll just, um, since I, I haven't finished the code, we'll have to do it sort of manually. Um, and so I talk about this first idea of tabularity and hyper. And so, oh, by the way, each one of these, this is using pop-up tagger. So after you create an annotation, you can add a tag to one of the four words, hypertext, weak or tiddly. And in fact, you could also add a tag to any of the techniques, filtering, linking, tagging, templating, and transclusion. And, um, and I will add a, another open-ended tagging there that, that uh, people can type their own tags in. So that's the idea of how to get some of these. This is the, the taxonomy, the structure tagging, and I have to build in the folksonomy tag and the open tag. So still to come. Hopefully today or by the time we release this podcast, it will come with the release of the podcast. So back to the substance. So what do you think? Tabularity? I completely agree. I think tabularity um, has... So, so hy the problem with hyper is that it's rooted in time. It's rooted in 1965. And the, the, the things you quoted last week um, that Ted Nelson said at the time, very much of that period. And yet, what I think I've learned from the book is that the process of freeing text from the confines of a strictly linear stream has actually been happening for hundreds of years. So I welcome having a new word for that. And I've been using tabularity quite a lot accordingly um, because it kind of fits a slot that I didn't have before. And hyper means a few other things. And you know, it has a few um, completely um, separate meanings, and not all of those separate meanings are helpful. Whereas tabularity is kind of literal meaning, being like a table. A table um, remains the best spatial expression of the principles that we're talking about. So, yeah, um, that's very much how I'd read it. Okay. The other things that I've, I can navigate by tags. The other places that I've pulled on the word hyper um, is here. Uh, Vandendorp uses great words, and I've got to get this into, into the um, punch theme, so that will also come, so that these look like slides instead of tiddlers. But um, he introduces a bunch of words, acrony, I had to look that word up, and so I, I put in my, uh, the, the best, definition I could find. Um, and I think it's just like you suggested, in some ways this, he's talking about oral text that deviates in time. Um, and this literary technique of acrony um, maybe suggests that hyper again is dealing with also this, this notion of multiple dimensions, but he references it in terms of these other literary terms, a deviation in which the information cannot be sorted out, there's too little to define it. Um, that's that long I, hypertext feeling, I think. It, it, it reminds me of one of the themes that I've got um, out of the book repeatedly, which is the connection with time and the confirmation that um, a lot of what we're trying to do here is to make space and time interchangeable. So to make that which we had to wait for, a particular point in a passage of text whilst it was being read, be instead something we can go to in space. Um, and so I quite like, I don't think I'm at the end yet of his musings on time, mm -hmm. um, but I think that's, and it, it also, um, it taps into something we'd talked about before about how speech and singing ties to the rhythm of walking which is also about time so I'm kind of um, rather intrigued by this uh, the, the temporal angle that Van den Dorp has managed 
to introduce. And one of the students, um, Shane, and maybe another one too. I can't remember exactly, but maybe others will pick it up. Are are working with weakifying podcasts, and we've talked about mm. that in the past a little bit about how you might be able to as a mm. as something is playing through time as it as the mm. audio or the video moves from either minute to minute or second to second, the, you, can, you can basically tag a moment in time. Yeah. And so that'll be, yeah. And, I, and I, I, I don't know that I've seen that elsewhere. So we'll have to see if we're unique in that. It's always, it's felt to me as if everything that we apply to text in hypertext could be made to apply um, to other media, um, yeah. video, particularly slicing video together. And certainly a goal in TeleWiki 5 was to try and, as I put it, to make audio and video be first-class citizens with text, which isn't entirely true, but it's getting there. Yes, um, and of course, hypertext refers not to text as in written, but text as a body. So it certainly should encompass audio and video. But the, the idea of tagging through time, I think, is something that you can only do an audio or video. You, you Tagging through time in... Well, in, except the Van den Dorp teaches us to think of... The, the, the text, the, the stream as being a, a temporally defined thing and mm. all, this, all this tabularity has given us the means to jump around that time axis by making the time axis spatial. Yeah, okay, excellent. Yeah, so that, I thought that was an interesting mm. That's very nice. Yeah, the, um, and, and it spends a chunk of time talking about these, um, again, more about hyper in literary works and linear texts that he references and this is I'm, I'm not a particularly literary person and, and so I don't get the references but I can grab them but he talks about a writer creates in a reader's mind a web of associations among dozens or thousands of elements hypertext avant la I mean that's just that's beautiful thought <laughs> I was quite happy to come across that um, well I think we, we've we've explored quite often how even if a book isn't a, a any given book isn't like a um, a hypertext entity, the process by which the book came into being looks a lot like hypertext. Yeah. However, it was done. So, so that's so here he's pulling back to the writer. So the writer's yeah. goals, and yes, and if, if you don't, and, and as we talked about last week in Tiddly Wiki, you make the hypertext navigation or the hypertextual the hypertextuality part of the punctuation of writing and so that just does exactly what Vandendorp is saying the writer aims to create the reader's mind but now we're not only creating it in the mind but we're creating it on the page that web of associations yes yeah, so that was that was i was mm. kind of in, in encouraged to come across that um and then i summarized my work on hyper um, with these three points, um, whenever I see the word hypertext by nature, I rebel because <laughs> I don't know that hypertext has a nature. But we can, but I, I that we can yeah. let that sit there. Um, and the second phrase of the second point: a hypertext is not necessarily nonlinear. That that's. I like that idea. Um, that because it, it 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 you can make a linear hypertext. I think I think that's I think that's my problem with that sentence is that it's capturing it's it's rather obliquely capturing a thought that I'm beginning to think must be important because we've come across it so so many ways, which isn't so much that the hypertext isn't necessarily linear isn't sorry isn't necessarily non-linear but that a hypertext can be used to produce or scaffold or be the skeleton of a non-linear work so the relationship isn't about being it's about producing or begetting um or deriving some some transformation process rather than a question of the identity of the thing because i i, I would disagree with the literal words there a hypertext is necessarily non-linear in the in the rather um uh, technical you know in our, our, our carefully defined ways of using both of those words a um a hypertext that was entirely linear would be a degenerate hypertext and it would therefore be 
we wouldn't call it a hypertext, you know, except for the sense in which set all the knobs to zero. And, you know, it's, it doesn't, that doesn't, and as I say, it fails to capture this really important thought about the relationship between hypertext and what we might call old fashioned linear text. But now that we're thinking about a spectrum, old fashioned linear text is still reasonably non linear because it's got word boundaries and paragraph boundaries and so on. So, so yeah, I'm not happy with that. I think there's the, those are, and come to think of it, two things. One, the recognition that hypertext to conventional text is a spectrum, and the second, that it doesn't state the relationship properly. But yeah. I love the I love the second one. Um, I mean, sorry, the third one. Yes. Um, which which renders the second point redundant. Yes. Um, that uh, we there is no distinction. Um, and, then, and I think I, I think I put them in not in the order in which they appear in the paragraph. Oh, okay. Because the only linear media was we now understand from Van den Dorp, the original scroll, the one without word boundaries, where the words, um, you know, where, where the letters went um, uh, side to side. Yes. On the, lines. the only that linear was, printed media, the speech he, he I think he infers is, is always yeah. linear. Yeah. But the only the only media um, as yeah. opposed to the thing. Okay. Um, yeah. So no, I think that's pretty good. I think he's he, he's maybe this makes me see the the overall shape as as chapter of chapter seven or essay seven as perhaps being an exploration that actually comes back with a rather emphatic answer, um, and that maybe Van den Dorp isn't even emphasising um, uh, that answer very strongly at this point, you know, because he's trying to be even-handed and explore the topic. Yeah, I um, and I want to pull on, um, like I said, I haven't quite got this. There we go, tagged up appropriately. Um, but I'm gonna, if I remember correctly, ah, here we go. I got it right. Um, this I think moves us into the to considerations of the notion of text in essay seven, but then we'll start here in the middle, which is about um, a, a question that occurred to me as I was reading this is that if you have a single text, but it serves multiple functions. So for example, this very text, the on Vandendorp text mm -hmm. can be designed to allow people to read it linearly as Vandendorp asked us to. And then by, and by uh, adding, or clicking a button, I can reveal, right, if you've, I've turned off my green highlights at the moment, but I can turn them back on or the reader can turn them back on and they can see my work on top of Vandendorf. That's a different kind of reading. It's a single text with multiple functions. That's, that's intriguing. It's, um, the multiple functions bit taps into something that we say about TiddlyWiki, which is that the purpose of recording information is to reuse it. And so the, this, this sort of, uh, there's this expectation in TiddlyWiki that you're going to want to use the stuff that you've written down. But you want to use it in different ways at different times of your, uh, of the, you know, where you have different, you have different purposes for reading. I think the, the other, um, well, there's a point that we, we touched on, I think, last time we, we talked about text was, that a, a text in the traditional sense, if I can use, the, use it like that, would, would be something that's bounded. I know which words are part of this text and which words are outside of it. Um, and the, that has some important properties that I can, I can review it in a meaningful way because I know that I've read all of it or that mm -hmm. I've read a statistically significant amount of it. Um, an unbounded text like the internet just doesn't have the same properties at all. And so I wonder if TiddlyWiki gives us a sense then of, uh, of a useful modern meaning of text, which is this idea as the container of all of the text that may be presented in multiple ways that may not even all of it be visible to all audiences or you know, any of the traditional assumptions. Um, but it has that characteristic that it's a bounded set of information. Yeah, so, so I, I think I agree with you there. I, I don't want to do what I'm suggesting we do here, is I don't want to define a text as a series of texts. I don't want my, this on Vandendorp Tiddly Wiki to have multiple texts. It's only one text. 
and then some parts of it are visible at different times depending on the reader's yeah. choices and that's i think that's important to from a design perspective um, and just in terms of making these neologisms work that use yeah. of text is congruent with the text part of hypertext and yeah that seems yeah that seems not bad yeah um I, I, he's got a, a beautiful um a couple of really interesting um, metaphors. He talks about text as mosaic, and here he talks about text as. Um, oh, and see, I, I need more. Um, oh, where did he talk about text as fabric? The essential care. Um, um, mm -hmm. Oh, terrible. Here it is. Yeah. Um, text is woven, intertwined, and braided. I love that, that, that it comes from that Latin term textus. We, we talked about that a couple weeks ago, maybe, about weaving, and I've, I've come across it again. Um, and again, it's text isn't inherently linear. It's always assembled or woven by the writer and the reader. It's constructed. And I think that's helpful to keep that in mind. It looks like I forgot to turn this type, tag this to text. No wonder I couldn't find it. Um, so demonstrating a little bit about how the pop-up tagger works. Um, and so I think that, I don't know if you've, if you've I know you've used, we've come across the word intertwingled, mm -hmm. uh, which is a Nelson word, sort of like intertwined, but it means something else. But this notion of text is woven, braided. I, I think that's helpful to keep in mind. It's also just, it, it reminds me again of um, a theme that keeps coming up um, that, that I've repeatedly emphasized. The, um, that which I thought had been invented in the 1960s has been around for hundreds of years. And again, this, um, so many of the ways of thinking and, you know, these metaphors um, that he's giving us here, ways of thinking about text absolutely were alive and well before what I knew as hypertext had arisen. And that, again, I, I keep making the same point. To me, that makes our collective work on hypertext easier, seeing yes. it as part of a longer term, um, you know, slower moving, but more powerful um, and more established revolution. Um, mm -hmm. Makes it a lot less scary than being, you know, thinking we were part of a 60s counterculture revolutionary um, <laughs> sort of mindset. Yeah, I, I like this as this point in paragraph eight here about, uh, and this comes back to your discussion last week about text as a physical artifact. Um, and so when I, uh, reading the notion of the material indication, the arrangement of text on the whiteness of the page. And, and I think that that would, that from a design perspective, again, that helps us, the arrangement of objects of text of the elements on the whiteness of the screen. Um, yeah, I think with poetry, we can see, again, a, a spectrum of poetry that, that, that some is very tabular and, and some is, is very linear. You know, I've seen poetry that doesn't have line breaks, for instance. Sure. Um, you know, we sort of, these are trivial innovations in the field of poetry, but maybe actually it gives us better, clearer examples. Um, <laughs> that these are, um, as, you know, the, the, the effect of laying out text with tabularity in poetry um, at, at its best um, is something that hits you viscerally and so maybe that's a better example than a table of river lengths or something. Yes, it, it, right. And so, um, and then I just wanted to um, close with this idea because I, this, this is how he ends essay or, or I think it's, oh, I think it's the only, it's 16 or 17, it's the end of the essay. Um, and that last sentence about, and maybe they're throwaways in effect, but a sure way to spoil our fun. It's just, that's so, um, I don't know, that, that's, it just feels wrong and limiting. I think it's sometimes fun to get the mystery, the answer to the, the solution to the mystery before reading the book. Yes, it depends on your relationship with the author rather. Sometimes, you know, in a, a role doll, um, uh, who, for me, um, I, might w I might be quite happy to pass myself over to his care and, um, and let, uh, take the story in the way that he's designed, but somebody else that I don't have the same kind of relationship with, yeah, absolutely. 
I mean, when you see rubbish movies, um, they <laughs> oddly can be more, much more fun when you know what is going to happen because then you can see the sort of the clumsy way in which they're closing the gaps in the story. Yeah, and um, perhaps it comes back to the point again, it depends on which reading. So maybe the second time you see a movie, you know the story, but it hasn't really spoiled your fun. It, it opens up other alternatives. Um, both in this and some other work I've been doing, we, we've made a strong distinction between the first reading and second reading. And yeah. clearly you can, your first reading can be like a second reading. You can make it be that way. But there is that, yes, the archetypal linear experience where... Um, time is a curtain that's slowly pulling back revealing the future versus at the second reading unless a lot of time has passed it's much more like swooping in an airplane where you can see the future and the past and there's no curtain. yeah and, you know and i feel that way um i from time to time go to opera which is an auditory experience mm -hmm. can be difficult but I find the second or third time I see the, the same performance, I, I get much more because I'm not concentrating on next, next, next. I'm, you know, it's just a very different feel. So. This is also the point that he's making here is also one that's, um, that looks very different from the reader's and the writer's perspective. So from the reader's yeah. perspective, this is about you know, the passive experience of giving yourself over to the gradual reveal. From the author's point of view, it's, I think, one of those things like ducks on the water where they look serene above the water, but there's lots of paddling to make sure that that reveal comes at the right point to make sure that you know, everything that the reader knows at given points in the book matches what has been revealed to them. All of that ensuring the internal logic of the book works. And so one is, you know, they're very, and obviously hypertext is, particularly about supporting the second part of the process, which is, you know, it's less magical than he says about spoiling our fun, you know, the magical um, mm -hmm. uh, point of reveal at the end of a fairy story when you know what happened to the wolf and the princess. Um, so, yeah, interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So that, that, that kind of wraps our discussion on seven, and, and I, uh, we'll leave it there. And the idea here is that if, you, if you've seen that this, this wiki is I've, I follow my, the instructions on the, uh, in here. Um, let me, oh, it's home here. Um, which says download the wiki, give it a name. Um, don't forget you have to type your name in so you get the name. So name it something watch last week's now you can watch this week's and then um read and annotate i you create your own version and then there will be a place where i collect your live links the ones that are stored on updog so this is my live link um that's actually wrong but we'll fix that um you have to actually put your url in there in the subtitle and then we're going to have a way by next week, I hope, Jeremy, right, of in ingesting other people's annotations. So pretty much everything tagged with annotag tiddler will come in to the on and then we'll expand the communities on Vandendorp to include other folks' annotags. Yeah. And, um, and that's going to involve going to advanced search, I think, and clicking filter getting a list of all yours and are we going to take the whole wiki or are we just going to take the export? No, the way we're going to do it is um, you're going to have on your computer um, the list of URLs for each wiki. Okay. And, and that, we'll go from there. And that filter. Um, that's the thing that says yeah. which tiddlers to extract from each one. Um, Great, Steve. I'm worried that I think you made a change that you might not have, that might be changed a tag that might not have triggered auto save. I think, the um the the annotating wiki might need saving oh really okay whichever one that was yes this one you can scroll down on the tools menu till you can see the save button and see if it's red yeah ah, so i must have changed something you, you you changed the tag using the drop down tag oh that's very oh, thank you so what happens if you change a tag using the drop down doesn't trigger auto save. Mm. I, I would I would personally keep that save button um, turned on if you see what I mean because you will confuse yourself if you do miss um, miss one of those.
Yes, and the save I just triggered was adding this to the yeah. bottom. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Good. Save Thank it. you very much, Jeremy. We will talk. We'll next be in week. touch. Yeah, brilliant. All Thanks very much. Thank you, James. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Have a nice day. Cheers. Bye. Bye.